Welcome to Inside Chips, the podcast that keeps you up to speed on the fast-moving world of the semiconductor industry. I'm your host, Gregory Haley, Technology Editor for Semiconductor Engineering. This week, we're diving into the Electronic Components and Technology Conference, better known as ECTC, where the world's top minds in advanced packaging, interconnects, reliability, and heterogeneous integration came together to share what's next for the chip industry. Now I'd like to welcome Laura Peters, our Senior Executive Editor at Semiconductor Engineering, uh, who spent last week at ECTC. Sounds like it was a really exciting week. Yeah, Greg, it really was. ECTC has really grown. And this year you had all the key players from Intel Foundry to Samsung, TSMC, AMD, Qualcomm, and of course, all the equipment and material suppliers who help them implement all their solutions. But there was just tons of buzz around all the problems with AI and high performance computing and how the chip design and package design people are gonna get together to solve all of these power problems in server racks. To me, there were really two important trends One is how is the power best delivered? And that was kind of brought out at the keynote speech done by AMD's Sam Nazinger. He talked about the need for, and it sounds like AMD is going forward with what they're calling direct liquid cooling, which apparently for people who haven't seen this, you can have like a rack vertically positioned and dielectric liquid that is flowing around the rack in direct contact with the electronics. It's a wild concept. (laughs) That's fascinating. Yeah. And and kind of necessary. I know that uh, thermal issues and power delivery are kind of a big deal right now and certainly uh, in the mix of the conversation. So it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that it would come up there. ECTC has kind of become the premier conference for packaging technology and, and where that's going. So uh, this is going to be really interesting to see how they solve some of the thermal issues and direct cooling. I've seen a couple of uh, conceptual drawings of what that might look like, but I'll be curious how they actually manage to implement that. Yeah, they're, they're, they really seem to be going forward with that. Um, they said that they prefer that definitely over microchannel cooling. Microchannel cooling just to them is not going to work. I thought that was a really interesting point. And another thing that he brought out in the keynote was how a lot of it was around power consumption. And an interesting point was how the software really needs to work together with the, the hardware in that if you have the software really optimized, you can reduce your power consumption by 30% relative to a non-optimized software solution. So I thought that was, you know, a really interesting metric. The other thing I would say, it was cool to see some of the technologies that we write about kind of coming to fruition, something like co-packaged optics, really people having solutions on the board and and showing them to customers and also hybrid bonding. Hybrid bonding was everywhere at the conference and there were standing room only for the panel discussions around hybrid bonding. And in particular, people are really scrambling for metrology solutions for hybrid bonding. There doesn't seem to be uh, an immediate solution And AFM can get you the information you want, but not at the speed you need for production, of course. So that's something we've written about before, but that's a key area that companies like KLA and Anto Innovation and Zeiss and others are really going to be working on. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of technologies that have traditionally been um, uh, offline bench test technologies and inspection equipment, trying to incorporate that into uh, high volume manufacturing just because they need that level of detail, but it also slows everything down, which affects yield. So I can see that being a real challenge for them. Right. So the other thing I noticed is we're really starting to see the ecosystem being built out for fan out panel level processing. It's still the early days, I would say. You know, the first manufacturing of devices on panels was for the Apple Watches, which of course those are very small substrates. 
And now people are looking to do HBM and larger devices on panels. The, you know, the entire ecosystem is is not there yet, but companies like Glam Research and Applied Materials are really working on putting together those pieces. And there's an announcement from um, IBM and DECA of their advanced fan out interposer manufacturing site in IBM Bromond. So some of that CHIPS Act funding is coming through in the United States and we're going to see more about panels, but it's still, like I said, early days. Yeah, the timing on that's pretty good because a lot of the fabs that are coming out of the CHIPS Act will start coming online next year. And it seems like they can get the, because buying that equipment and putting that equipment in line is part of the big issue with how you move to that fan out panel level packaging. So if they can get the technology resolved, technology issues resolved in time for the fabs to come online, then they can get that equipment in place. And it really does offer some advantages in terms of yield and, and, uh, and packaging, but it's going to be a challenge to implement just, especially on older lines. Right. The usual uh, problems that we've talked about warpage and for substrates are going to be the big issues for panel. Right. And, uh, there, yeah. So there was a lot of talk about that and what levels of warpage are okay. You know, how many millimeters of warpage across a panel are acceptable. And so there were really interesting uh, discussions around that too. What about uh, things around high density interconnect or interposer technologies that some companies are trying to develop in, in terms of putting uh, electronics directly in the interposers, uh, circuits in the interposers, that sort of thing? Did you see much about that? Yeah, in fact, there were there was a panel about that as well, where they were talking about capacitors and putting multiple capacitors in. And how can we build this into the RDL? What, what's going to go on the backside of the printed circuit board? What's going to go where? Because then and there's new developments in capacitor technology to make them smaller too, just to you know, be able to build them into these smaller formats. So that's another area where there's just a ton of innovation going on. Are there any particular companies or, or technologies we should keep an eye on in the, over the next the next six months? Yeah, you know, I I think this power delivery to to systems is just going to be an overall thing. It, it's an issue for obviously these server racks now, but in hyperscalers. But it's it's an issue for cell phones. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's something all of this trickles down. And so power delivery, I mean, we're just going to see all kinds of innovative, uh, obviously something like backside power. Okay, backside power is happening, but there's still issues around fault isolation. And I had some inter interesting interviews about that. You know, you're, the metal gets in the way. What do you do? Do you cut out the metal and, and do some FA? And, and do you do circuit editing and then recover the metal. It's still not clear exactly what strategies people are going to be using, even though it appears that a lot of the uh, processes are in place. That doesn't mean that all of the FA is in place. And another interesting thing that Laura Makarimi from um, Adia brought up about hybrid bonding, she said, you can have, you're bonding two wafers and you can have like a defect or a particle or something, and you can have a wafer just slide off of the other wafer. What do you do? And she said, what, what I think the industry needs to start thinking about is rework procedures for hybrid bonding. And I think that kind of woke people up because that's something we haven't talked about before. That's really interesting. One of the I had a brief conversation uh, at ITF World with Synopsys specifically about hybrid bonding issues and and the handling is a big piece of that too, right? Especially uh, with the, the pickers that come in and pick these pieces up can crush the edges of chips, can have you know a f impact on how that bond it could be a, a really good bond in the in the machine, and then when they come and move it, can have offset that alignment a little bit. So a lot of real small technical details to figure out around that, but I can see why everyone right. would be interested in it because it solves so many problems if they can nail it down. 
Right. Yeah, you're doing carrier technology and you're thinning your wafer down to hardly any silicon. So you can imagine that that can cause all kinds of problems at the edge of the wafer where it's at its thinnest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, th there's awful precise process control measures that have to be taken to to keep keep that process where you want it to be. Right. I'd also like to say a few things about ECTC as a conference. They celebrated their 75th year of ECTC this year. It was really well attended. Uh, there were about 2,400 people. They had over 500 people at their professional development programs. And so I thought that was really encouraging because those, you know, companies are sending young engineers to learn about advanced packaging and packaging in general, the newest technologies. And we even saw startup companies and companies who I didn't even recognize at, at the exhibit hall. And I think that's an indication of just how much innovation is going on in materials and, and software in every area of um, assembly and packaging technology. So we're going to see just a ton of in innovation going forward. And this link between chip manufacturing and assembly and packaging is only going to get closer and closer. And we see that even with the Foundries working even closer with the OSATs today. Collaboration is becoming a, a, a bigger issue across the industry. I think people are talking more about it and the necessity of it. The technology for producing these chips has become so complex, and we're starting to see a lot of bifurcation within the industry, where some people focus on one kinds of chipset, whether it be AI or or power delivery, or you know, it's you're starting to see that kind of division. Um, so collaboration is becoming a, a bigger need. Did you see any surprising perspectives on that? Anything come up uh, as part of the conversation? You know, I, I wasn't surprised by anything at ECTC, but I did see um, an OTF presentation from Light Matter, mm -hmm. and, and they have a co-packaged optics solution, and they put up a slide of all of their partners. You know, they're, they're a fabulous company. So TSMC, but you saw several competitors there, right? <laughs> you know, so it, it, it has gotten to the point where the best of the best are being selected for their particular expertise. And that's what fabulous companies have access to. So these collaborations really are becoming different than they used to be. Yeah. And in some surprising ways, of course, Lip Bhutan at Intel was talking more about opening up its foundry to more collaboration work instead of being specifically for Intel chips, allowing other companies to come in and help work with them as well. I, I anticipate we'll see more of that kind of, what was the old term from the 90s, co-opetition, uh, where, right. you know, who are competitors with each other, but still need to work together in certain ways uh, in order to accomplish some of these extraordinarily complex tasks. Yeah. You, you see these people at the parties together. You see them, you know, in the halls together talking. And and I think it's a sign of something that's always kind of been there in this industry from way back when, where, you know, it's it's just engineers sharing ideas and rolling up their sleeves and saying, hey, what are you doing in this area? And and this is kind of what we're doing. And we're, it's, it's just fun to see that uh, still happening. It's, it is a very exciting time for engineering in the industry right now. I think there's a, a, a resurgence, sort of a renaissance of new ideas because there's so many new needs. So it's kind of an exciting time to be watching that and observing it and reporting on it. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, this has been Laura Peters, our Senior Executive Editor at Semiconductor Engineering, who went to ECTC last week. Really appreciate your time, Laura, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Greg. And that's it for this week's episode of Inside Chips. We'll be back next week with more insight, analysis, and conversations from the cutting edge of semiconductors. In the meantime, if you like this episode, be sure to follow and share Inside Chips, and check out the full coverage at semiengineering.com.